So first of all, welcome everyone. Um, sorry for that slightly embarrassing uh, and not as slick as it could have been introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm Mike Powell, so I'm pleased to be uh, moderating uh, this session. Um, I've, it's been a great, a great morning. I think one of the things I'd like to congratulate the Smart Maritime Network is a bit of a digital pivot that they've undertaken uh, to get us all together on this platform at the last minute. Most of us wanted to be in Copenhagen and and and, uh, and regret uh, not being there. Um, but uh, you know, the fact that we're able to be together at all is is quite. Uh, Quite, quite spectacular, actually, and, and, and much credit to the team. Um, I'd have to say I've got some surprise uh, that seven of you uh, didn't think that uh, Rob Dwyer was rocking the bold look, um, <laughs> although uh, it is possible I may have a small bias uh, in, in, in that respect. Um, and the other thing, there was only 50-odd people voted, and we all know that if you don't vote, then all sorts of trouble can happen. Um, so uh, just to talk a, a little bit, uh, um, uh, if, I, if I may, about the, the preceding, uh, some of the, the stuff that happened here. It was interesting that aviation were, were, were on and IATA and uh, the aviation um, seems to be so far ahead of us in some respects. Uh, I always thought that, we, you know, we did, um, they've only ce recently celebrated 100 years of flight. Um, we've got at least 5,000 years, so I don't know how we gave them quite such a head start. But um, but now hopefully we're trying to 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 to, to fix that. Um, uh, Stratum Five, just uh, just for those that don't know, is is a company that um, offers a range of uh, tracking, um, weather, and and data solutions to uh, to to about twelve and a half thousand ships. Um, we, um, I, I was very interested in the noon report um, because we, we had to kind of cross that bridge uh, ourselves to, to, to get our, our solution up and running. But uh, that's, enough of, that's enough about Stratum 5. I've got a really great panel uh, to talk about supply chain optimization um, and, and the availability of what, what transparency means to, to all of us um, and some of the limitations. Uh, of I've kind of organized it in a way where we have um, a different great panel different perspectives i'm going to introduce uh, each one individually let them have a, a short intro uh, we've got about an hour uh, if i don't waste too much more of it and um we've then got a q a sessions please throw in the uh the, the questions uh into the into the sessions and we'll get we'll get straight into that it's, we want you to participate fully so firstly i'm going to attempt to share a slide which could be uh, fraught with risk um but we'll give that a go uh, Michael, uh, take it away. Sure, I guess we're just going to do a little bit of a intro round here before we get to the actual interesting uh, discussions. Again, my name is Michael Rohde. I'm a Vice President of Corporate Development, Cognite uh, AS. Uh, Cognite is the Alcotter Group uh, here in sunny, warm Oslo, Norway. Uh, so we are driving organization in heavy asset industries. Um, so. Uh, mainly a lot of oil and gas is our kind of historical perspective, but uh, we also have maritime customers, uh, manufacturing, uh, et cetera. Uh, previous to this position here, I was in uh, AP Molinmersk there in Copenhagen, where I spent four and a half years driving a lot of the uh, technology projects within uh, the fleet management side, but also uh, back at the time when we were a large conglomerate still in other business units as well. Uh, that was Maersk Drilling and Maersk Oil and uh, Switzer, et cetera. Uh, also, I have a background from Saudi Aramco and also Statoil, so a lot of oil and gas uh, experience. Uh, yep, yeah, so I'm here today to try to bring, I'd say, more the owner-operator side of, of the uh, perspective uh, to the discussion. Um, yep, thank you. Hey, thanks, Mike. Uh, hopefully, I can change this slide now. That would be good. Dita, you'd like to say hi? Oh, yeah, I couldn't get my uh, microphone off mute. Thank you. Uh, so my name is uh, Dita Vlaen. I'm Director of Operations for uh, Port Exchange. We're a, a startup. Uh, actually, we uh, started uh, in 2018 in uh, Rotterdam, optimizing uh, port calls and uh, with a, a digital platform combining planning and actual information from all the different actors in the, in the supply chain. 
Uh, and now we are deploying this platform in, uh, in various ports around the world because the Port of Rotterdam also has said this is not something that we should do as a port, but uh, something that we should do as a maritime industry and uh, work together uh, as ports and actors in a port to uh, improve efficiency and to reduce uh, emissions. So I'm very excited uh, about the work that we're doing. Uh, previously, I uh, held various positions working in shipping. Uh, I also worked in, uh, in Maersk, uh, always uh, uh, on operations and process improvement. So it's super exciting to, uh, yeah, to now uh, make an impact in emissions and uh, increasing efficiency in, uh, in shipping. So uh, what is on my mind uh, for, for this uh, panel discussion uh, today? is that first of all, I think in order to uh, digitalize the shipping industry, uh, we need to uh, uh, collaborate all together. And uh, yeah, that's uh, something that we hear a lot about. But um, yeah, the biggest question on my mind is how do we move from a shared responsibility to actually uh, people feeling accountable for it? Because that's always the risk. If you have a shared responsibility, yeah, then who is going to uh, pick it up and, and really do something about it? And that's also something that uh, we sometimes run into with, with our uh, projects um, to find a coalition of the willing to really drive this uh, digital change in the industry. And the second point is um, uh, what we see a lot is, is uh, talk about digitalization. But why would you want to digitalize? I think the why question is super important. What is, what is it that we would like to achieve? with digital tooling and uh, yeah, what, what is the end state sort of the vision that we have in mind. And then the third point is uh, about sustainability because uh, uh, yeah, money talks, we all know that. And um, how do we get emissions on the business case as well and make sure that uh, that becomes uh, equally important. And uh, yeah, sometimes uh, I, I feel uh, uh, I'm a little bit like uh, the green piece of shipping and people look at me like, uh, what are you talking about? But yeah, I think emissions should definitely be on the business case as well. Well, that's just a very small scope that you've got there. I'm sure we'll be able to get that through that lot in an hour. But uh, but actually, you know, it's great. We need that. We need the green piece types in shipping. So for sure. So Richard, from one port to many ports. Hi all, thank you Mike, uh, welcome to the panel and to everyone else. I'm Richard Morton, I'm the Secretary General of the International Port Community System Association. We have over 50 members in over 50 countries around the world. They operate in about 500 seaports and their focus is port community systems, the single window operators for both sea and airports and also land borders. And we, our members operate in ports that handle in excess of 500 million TEUs, 20 billion tons of cargo. And we've been talking about many of these topics for the last 10 years or so since our inception and mirror very much what Dita has already said, which is collaboration. Collaboration is the key part. How do we actually make effective collaboration? Because actually it's as much about people as it is about technology. Everybody thinks technology is the answer. No, technology is the enabler. And we have to ensure that the people are engaged in it all the way through. But once you've got that collaboration, you need standards. We've seen many initiatives out there developing new standards and developing and statements saying there are no standards. In fact, shipping has had standards for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, now we're in a world of technology, which is adapting and updating those standards. But the question is how many, how much of the shipping industry are using actual standards or adapting them to their own needs to make them non-standard? And finally, from our perspective as poor community systems and single windows, how do we network platforms around the world? And they're the three key areas we see happening over the next 20 years. Thank you. Fantastic intro. Thanks very much. Um, now, um, from um, one port, to, from fleet to one port to many ports to the beneficial cargo owners, the door-to-door -door guy. I think that would be me, Jakob Voorspij. Uh, so I work with uh, GS1 at the moment. Um, we are the most widely used uh, supply chain system of standards worldwide. So our organization basically represents like 2 million user companies, most of which are beneficial cargo owners. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, 
our barcodes, the identification keys are probably scanned well over 10 billion times every single day of the year. Um, so today I'll be representing the beneficial cargo owner perspective mostly. Um, I am also the co-chair for the International Task for Sport Call Optimization, which is one of the bodies that tries to um, establish uh, new standards or apply existing standards within the uh, maritime environment. Um, so before we continue with uh, the, the, the panel discussions, there's a few things I need to get off my chest. They're more or less on this slide as bullet points. So transportation is always a result from a sell and buy transaction of goods. So ultimately, this is all about the buyer and the seller of the goods. So anything we do in transportation must be focused to meet the needs of those beneficial cargo owners. Otherwise, ultimately, our paymasters, the beneficial cargo owners, will not be happy with us. One other thing that I will like to highlight is that in addition to the cost and the speed nowadays, especially after all the disruptions, beneficial cargo owners need predictability in supply chains. Uh, why? Basically because uh, the more unpredictable the supply chain is, exponentially the level of stock levels rises and as a result um, the cost for holding this in stock level also exponentially rises for beneficial cargo owners they have started to realize that transportation has this knock-on effect huge knock-on effect in their supply chains they will no longer tolerate transportation that is unpredictable and unreliable going forward that brings me to the final point is the um, practice, the current conventional wisdom or business practice of I want to um, be, uh, sorry, I want to create as much competitive advantage as I can to a level that I would call obsessive. That is, stands in the way of the collaboration that is necessary in order for the industry as a whole to meet the needs and therefore the demands of the beneficial cargo owners. So summarized in one line, obsessive focus on competitive advantage is a recipe for disaster for the industry, but also for the individual company. And you can see this already that large shippers we all know the two A's that go with them, have started to develop alternatives to the incumbents are running TNL operating networks. So that's me in two and a half, three minutes. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. So yeah, we can all collaborate as long as it's around my solution. Is that what <laughs> yeah. you're what you trying to say? Okay, well, I didn't mean mine personally, but uh, okay, well, thanks, thanks for that, Jakob. I'm sure we're gonna come back to that uh, next up, if I can get it up, there you go, get that up, next slide up, is, uh, is, is, is Michael Lin and uh, his perspective, he's worked uh, uh, regional models and, and so he has a lot to say about, I guess, the prospects of collaboration, but uh, here we go, Michael, all your... Thank you, and of course, uh, my solution is the best one, so everybody should choose that as well, right? So <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, I come from uh, Research Institute of Sweden, uh, an independent and a neutral body that is uh, highly engaged in, in uh, global supply chain uh, questions in different ways. I've been uh, pushing and running port GDM issues for, for many years and, uh, and uh, I'm taking those uh, learnings with me now uh, when we are talking about the, the larger whole, so to say. Uh, my perspective uh, is that smart chain, smart supply chains, uh, is really about collaborative alignment. Uh, if we realize how much uh, disruptions that happens in a in a in a ship's um, port rotation schema, for example, visiting Asia, uh, you, you, we also uh, can see that the the um, original plan did not stand. So therefore, we we really need to go into some kind of adjustment. Um, opportunities where there needs to be a lot of guys on board to, to ensure that that alignment. Uh, 
and, and digitalization can support us here uh, in communicating or allowing for the communication of progress and disruptions along the transport chain and that not uh, only concerns the, the, uh, the maritime transport, it concerns the whole tra transport chain. The key enablers for sure are standardized data sharing. Uh, we need to, uh, in, uh, as Richard is talking about as well, we need to be able to connect local uh, communities or information sharing communities with each other. And we also see phenomena now uh, being raised on horizontal information sharing communities, such as, for example, trade lands. We see smart ports, we see smart ships, etc. not only becoming information consumers, but also information providers. We see uh, solutions, processes to track and trace. We see connected cargo, smart containers, for example, and also what we elaborated rather recently about uh, the, the uh, need for aggregated data for making holistic decisions that I said is a concern for our society, our people that are dying or starving from, from death uh, to death just because of the food is not arriving in time or uh, securing our planet. So by this, uh, I would like to say that we need to adopt a holistic approach to the transport chain we need to view um, ports as transshipment hubs and not just as a window to the sea. And also uh, what is now being surfaced, maritime informatics as a new discipline that is uniting both practitioners and researchers in how digitalization can um, contribute to enhanced efficiency, sustainability, resilience and safety of shipping, where we need to cater for the balance between capital productivity and energy efficiency which then needs to be based on a high degree of predictability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, last but never least, um, we, have, we have Eric uh, and uh, a very enticing uh, figure on, on, on the screen, in the middle of the screen. So uh, Eric, please give us your perspective. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was lowballing the number for this presentation. So my name is Eric Lund, and uh, I'm heading up uh, an IoT um, tracking division at Sony called uh, Vesillion, uh, coming out of the, the, the strong heritage of telecom connectivity uh, from, from the Sony days in, in Sweden. Um, Vesillion is a, um, a, 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 a corporate uh, scale-up, uh, so, uh, you know, working uh, as much as we can in a, in a startup mode and uh, a startup uh, clock frequency, but in the confines of, uh, of, of a corporate setting or Sony with, with uh, uh, very patient owners, if you say that way, used to think the long term. Um, I have a, a background from, from transport logistics, and I'm, I'm actually say I'm quite disappointed that we are only half of the panel having a merged background this time. <laughs> uh, when we are talking about conferences in Denmark, then uh, it's normally a higher proportion we're talking about, but have spent a lot of time in the, uh, in the technology space uh, within particular IoT and digital security, uh, as well as have, have worked uh, both in the um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, area, uh, both for myself as well, uh, before actually joining Sony, um, work with, with corporate innovation and venture building in the uh, maritime and, uh, and logistics space. And, and basically what we are in terms of resilient is that we provide, um, you know, uh, asset tracking capabilities, real-time asset tracking capabilities and, and supply chain uh, visibility, both when we're talking indoor setting as well as traditional uh, logistics supply chain settings. And, you know, Contrary to many other, um, this year has been a blessing in disguise. Uh, transport visibility has been on the agenda for for for, for most companies for, uh, for for several years. It's not necessarily a new uh, a new uh, technology area. It's maturing, but but still uh, we've never really gotten the traction that we looked for with what we saw, particularly in the beginning of the year. Uh, with you know massive disruptions of, of supply chains, whether for the good, for the bad, you need to hold cargos back. You need to accelerate, uh, you know, the critical cargo delivery. Uh, you found out that you know the the, the visibility in in most cases uh, at, on a, at a practical level was missing. So that means that 
uh, visibility as an enabler for both for supply chain visibility, excuse me, supply chain resilience uh, to having a robust supply chain, having a multi-sourcing set up in place and so on and so forth, as well as the flip side of that, the agility uh, is really uh, being enabled by, by, by what we do. So, so, so that is driving a lot of business for it. And I truly like the, the, the clip out of the, the tweet from, uh, from, from, from BCD that it really puts, frames it very nicely. And you see this was basically from May already. Um, so, so really what, what we are talking about echoing what, um, echoing what Michael said before that, you know, you, you built and reinforce a single source of truth to strengthen capabilities across uh, your, your value chain, uh, providing you know, new possibilities for optimizing what you're doing, as well as offsetting the types of crisis and black swans events that we've been through now. And, and as such, it is estimated really when you look at next-gen supply chain management, not only in this field, but also you know, in last mile autonomous delivery and so on and so forth, robotics, then, then we are talking about a, a 75 billion opportunity that we are all trying to go for, whether the startups or the, the corporate players in this. So, so from, from this, it's really, this, finally the logistics and supply chain managers are being brought out of the basement and brought into the uh, boardroom because they are of imperative critical importance for the uh, livelihood of companies these days. Thanks very much. And I think I, I do love that analogy of um, the basement to the boardroom, because I think one of the things that uh, shipping's always relied on in the past is not being visible. And, and, um, and now that transparency is, you know, we already, we were becoming accustomed to it anyway. But I think you raise a good point. I think it would be, it would be wrong of us not to ask the question about, um, you know, how is the pandemic, uh, um, impacted your particular agendas from your perspective? I mean, clearly it's been very bad for Mink in Denmark. That's not what it, it doesn't work out well for them. Um, but I, so if you, if you would like to, so you take, if the panel could take that, you know, how has the pandemic Im impacted your, you know, what, what you're trying to do? And I, I'm going to, I'm going to go for, I'm going to, I'll take it in the same order. You can stick your hand up as well, if you like, but Michael, if you uh, got anything to say on that. Um, you know, that's funny about the pandemic is either you flourish or you sink, right? And it's not necessarily fair either because there's a lot of industries, travel, transportation, et cetera, that, that got slammed. And then there's other industries that did extremely well, right? And if we look at, you know, look at the the, the freight rates right now, man, pretty fantastic. And so a lot of shippers have done well. So for us that kind of are on the digital delivery side, uh, I would say that this has been a bit of a blessing because what's happened is that companies uh, have been really slashing capex, especially in the oil and gas industry. And you know you can only cut so much before you start looking at where do I cut in opex, and that got them turning to what is the low hanging fruit for how can we drive value from our business? How can we you know basically kind of pick that low hanging fruit to 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 further optimize our opex or increase our our production or make it more efficient. So for us, at least, it's been uh, businesses absolutely booming. Uh, so I say that lightly because there's a lot of people that are not doing well right now, and it, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. So I think on the organization side, see it right now in, in tech IPOs, all right? We can see it in um, how many companies are, you know, if you look at the earnings reports from on the software side or on uh, OEMs providing hardware as well, it's, it's been a, a boom time for the technology side of the business. Okay, and there was, there was something that Yako um, brought up that I wanted to sort of bring to you as the as the ex sort of fleet guy. Uh, he talked about you know, predictability and and more predictability and how and in a in a marine environment particularly and for some of us that have stood on the bridge of a ship and tried to get it to somewhere on time. Uh, I was just wondering what your views might have been about about the predictability and what what we can do that would help Yako's problem. Michael, did you know that one? Oof. I'm a, I was actually almost going to turn over to Dita on that one. <laughs> Since those two are actually both kind of playing in that space. She's, I mean, the reason I say it is because Dita, you're working with the operators right now. And you're, you're addressing this problem right now. You're talking to multiple operators as well. So you kind of have this multi-lens view on, on Yako's problem in many ways. Yeah. 
No, thanks. Uh, so so uh, to start with, with your question, Mike, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, the impact obviously is very big of the, of the pandemic on uh, the global economics. And also we see that uh, in, uh, in ports. I mean, volumes are uh, down in many ports. You see it in, uh, in bunker prices that are low. And um, so, so the impact is very big. But we also see another problem that we didn't see during the economic crisis of uh, 2008. And that's uh, around the working remotely. And that's something new that everybody suddenly has to deal with, that we're not working together, sitting in the same office, planning uh, our logistics operations on a whiteboard or in face-to-face -face meetings. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, something that everybody suddenly has to deal with. So if you ask me how it affected uh, our work at Port Exchange, I actually see that uh, some of the projects get uh, accelerated or uh, that ports suddenly uh, are very interested in digitalizing because, yeah, you now have to work remotely and um, uh, uh, then information is, is, is super important. And then also, yeah, to go to the, to the second point, uh, uh, I think predictability is, uh, is, is then the next step, right? If you have digital information, if you uh, can work remotely because you have all information available in one single uh, place, then also you can start applying technologies like machine learning to, uh, to predict things and to anticipate early on in the process and to thereby avoid uh, certain problems from, from happening. So, so that's then the, the next step. Brilliant. Okay, and uh, um, Michael, you stuck your hand up there. You've, uh, would you like to add something? Uh, I think that that um, this um, this notion of shared situational awareness is a very important um, component for for managing enhanced degree of predictability. As long as we do not have a governing structure, as you maybe would have in in the in the aviation sector, uh, this is the only way forward. And that means basically that. Um, that uh, when somebody knows something that needs to be shared to the other ones uh, in order to uh, have them all to share the same common situation awareness and that will raise predictability and we managed to do that through through the port cdm test beds when, when we did this in the 13 ports uh, and that was the idea was in principle based on that there are there is not one single data source there are multiple data sources and that is also what you see now happening uh, the european commission they forecast that the amount of setabytes uh, coming today from, from uh, sensitized objects are 20% out of the total volume of data. And that relationship uh, is going to be reversed by 2025 uh, with, with a huge amount of data. And that means that we will derive more of this intelligence. Just to answer the first question also uh, on the pandemic, pandemic uh, here, um, me and Eric and, and a couple of others, uh, we, we really engaged in a, in a in a paper with um, or an article with UNC TED and World Economic Forum, where we uh, basically highlighted that think about the vision if you would be able to tag a container as a critical COVID container that could be fast laned in a port or at, at different places. And that requires data sharing between the different places that they, they cannot act in competition, basically. They need to come to an agreement that uh, this is uh, enough valuable but not competitive enough data that needs to be aggregated and shared along the whole supply chain. Brilliant, thanks. Has anybody else got um, particular pandemic influences that they would like to uh, to discuss? Jaco? You're, you're, you're muted. Clicked it right now, yep. You so did. basically, yeah. <laughs> Um, so we represent, uh, well, we are a neutral not-for-profit body. We represent these 2 million user companies. We work with them. To, um, uh, so basically we uh, have companies in pretty much every um, sector in uh, that that's out there. Uh, so I tend to agree with Michael that uh, the, the blows uh, as well as the rewards uh, fall uh, in unpredictable well before the COVID, yeah anyway unpredictable places um so as a, as gs1 we also don't know exactly how it's going to work out for us as a standardization body because uh, clearly people that uh, uh, feel the blows may have different things on their minds than standardization um so that brings me to the second uh, contribution uh as gs1 as a, a team we uh developed a fairly uh, sizable uh, report 
for the UN ASCAP, which is a UN uh, uh, body that deals with treaties, uh, uh, trade agreements, uh, um, uh, and how to improve them uh, as a uh, to better deal with pandemics and other crises that disrupt the flow of product. Um, and basically, we agree with Michael's statement that you need to be able to identify what's critical and what's not and to make sure that that stuff is available and that it also crosses the borders um, uh, easily. Uh, and we have uh, uh, set out a 10-step plan in line with the uh, pandemic response uh, framework from the World Health Organization that basically says that the application of global data standards, anybody's global data standards that would help facilitate the flow of cargo in response to a pandemic, but also any period outside a pandemic or other crisis is the way forward to uh, improve the performance of transport and logistics network for the benefits of the sellers and the buyers of the goods that we, you, me, and, and businesses need uh, at the time they need them. Great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to some of the threads that you picked up on there. Richard, you, you had a hand up. Thanks, Mike. I think most people have covered. What we've seen from the pandemic is that there's now less resistance to change. Prior to the pandemic, if you went to your boss and asked them, can I work from home? It was a difficult discussion to have. Now it's acceptable. So there's now much more or much less resistance to those change of the normal working habits, which then leads people to a change of other priorities in terms of standards, exchanging information, data, because their mindsets are now being uh, in the right place. We've also seen, as Dieter said, digitalization has become a priority in ports, um, which is a great thing. However, sometimes ports and other people want digitalization tomorrow. Uh, one port spoke to us says that we need a smart gate. And it's like, what do you mean by a smart gate? What's it going to do? What's it connected to? How are you going to share the data? What's the process related to? So it's more than just about digitalization. It's about the process that you're looking at. But you've also seen there's more flexibility from administrations, customs authorities who are now working remotely, um, border agencies and those things. So there are some real value that has come out of the pandemic. However, some of the challenges are you see multiple technology companies coming into the field of maritime. Um, you've got all of the new internet of things, uh, drones and others. And when you speak to them, they're very good at their technical standards. But when you say, what data standards are you using to collate the data? They say, oh, well, it's our own proprietary data standards. And therefore it's interoperable. There was one example of a port in Europe that implemented a whole blockchain uh, for a gate in and gate out process. The question was asked, what type of container is being released? And they said, what do you mean? It's a container. The container is a container. But we all know a container isn't a container. And for risk and security measures, that's hugely important to know that sort of detail. So the challenges we've seen coming from the pandemic is this rise of technology companies and processes from organizations that have very little understanding of maritime. And as technology companies, they're bringing in proprietary standards which tie people into their own technology, which doesn't help the interoperability that we're talking about in terms of collaboration in order to get down to the um, supply chain dashboard of the World Economic Forum, where you can green lay goods that are required for um, national, natural disasters, uh, man-made disasters, pandemics. And I think that's some of the challenges that you have is how do you um, manage creating those green lanes for critical and essential goods with the risk and security aspects that countries have automatically? So that's really where we've seen the pandemic having huge amounts of benefits, but some challenges which will stay with us for a long time if people aren't using the standards around them. I think, I think we'll talk a bit more about those challenges because I think that's a really, really worthwhile thread to pursue. Eric, you, uh, you indicate you had something to say on this. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll basically echo a lot of what, what Richard is saying uh, in, in terms of change willingness. Uh, 
definitely, so many have had their fingers burned, so many have not been able to actually do stuff that they are very willing to explore new technologies at a completely different rate than they normally uh, would be. And and again, I said, that's been a blessing in disguise for, for us because we can really push what, what we are trying to do in terms of uh, visibility solutions. I, I say the second point uh, that Rachel brought up that, uh, you know, everybody and his uncle is trying to sell it sector now. Uh, you know, coming from what we're doing, uh, I was doing earlier in, in the uh, in the innovation and, and, and startup space, I must admit the majority of the companies that we came across, or the fair part of the companies we came across, did have deep industry experience, understood what uh, what they were talking about. It's not like, you know, anyone can make a FinTech app uh, for, for doing something like that, but really we saw a relatively strong competences for, for a good part of the companies we're working with. And I think that, as you say, interoperability, understanding uh, the field you're, you're operating in, in this is, is absolutely critical for the success. Yeah, M Michael, you wanted to chime in there? Yeah, just one thing, and I started, I was listening through all the conversations and I was thinking about kind of forward looking at what's gonna happen. And if, if I went back to let's say March, I think we were all, especially in the maritime, looking at a bit of a race to the bottom, right? If we saw share prices of all the, you know, the big container carrier companies dropping like, you know, exponential drops. It was it was pretty bloody. And what we've seen instead of this race to the bottom has actually been a race to the top. It's been really interesting to watch what's happened and how people responded in this situation over the past, you know, eight months or so uh, from the shipping side. And I'm really speaking about container ships right now. I mean, if you follow Lars Jensen and you listen to what he talks about I mean, see Intelligence Consulting, and he, you know, he paints a, a very good picture of what's happening here. So we're entering into the end of the year in a, from a, the Maritime side, at least a very healthy perspective, right? And this is an industry that is traditionally boom and bust, right? So if, if we then start thinking about maritime digitalization, uh, it's amazing that actually the big container carriers work together over these past eight months as well. That was something I did not expect. I thought it would be knives out, cutthroats. So going into next year, this is where it's going to be really interesting because what will we see? Will we see this continuation of working together, right? Which will then reinforce what everyone here is saying around this idea around shared standards and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm hoping that these past eight months taught a lot of people that we're stronger if we work together, we're stronger if we share our data, we're stronger if we look at this from a more holistic position instead of, again, this marginal cutthroat business. Time will tell. Yeah, I would certainly point out there's more to the world than containers. They they have done a good good job of managing what's happened. Though, if you look at tankers, though, you see a rather different story over the over the last uh, over the last year. Um, but I think one of the threads uh, that I wanted to pick up on uh, was around the roadblocks to standardization and and actually who can I can I can I just add... yeah go go for it Jakob. Yeah, because I, I wanted to sort of uh, say this interoperability uh, uh, thing. Um, I think when we're talking about interoperability, we should not just limit ourselves to a specific mode of transport. We are on a smart maritime network session, but we are talking about smart supply chains. By definition, supply chains are multimodal. They are also across any and all sectors, from CPG to technical industries to medical to chemical, you name it. So basically what we need to try and get to uh, is interoperability among all of those standards that currently exist in the various modes of transport and sectors, at least to the extent that we can get to it. And this is also why I very much like Julian's statement just before in the session, where IMO at least is not trying to invent new standards, but they are trying to try and combine existing standards. Since it is the maritime organization, I have a feeling it would be the maritime standards that they are talking about for the moment. But thinking of maritime as an indispensable, but yet only a component in a transport and logistics network, I would urge that we look beyond the borders of our own mode of transport. I see lots of hands waving now, so I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, well, that, that's great. I'm really happy about that. It saves me work. Um, yeah, Richard. Yeah, just to clarify, the actual IMO file compendium, the new data model that IMO has developed, has harmonized the World Customs Organization 
data model, the ISO data model, and also the UNCFAC multimodal transport data model. So they are looking at the maritime component of that. However, because it is ma matched and mapped to the UNCFAC multimodal transport data model, it does mean it covers all forms of transport that if you decide as a company or organization to use that as your data standard, you would then be able to cover it across all of the modes. So there is thinking behind that. And I think that's the important thing. The problem is over the last years, standards has become a business. Even not-for-profit businesses are still there. It's still a business. It's still about how many of these standards can I sell? ISO, you buy standards, those types of things. We need to get back to open source standards and UNC fact, of course, can be a central part of that because it already is open standards. Uh, the challenge you've really got is if you have standards, organizations need to actually use those standards and not adapt them to their own needs. Because what you see happening is somebody will take a standard and then they'll add their own company details to it, their own purchase order numbers to it. And therefore you start corrupting that standard with other information. If everybody down the supply chain does that, it's like Chinese whispers in the end. It's at the end of it, you get something completely different from what you started with. I mean, that's, that's great. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna move, move along, along the same thread if, if, if I can, because you know, Yako um, make, makes a point about, so the, the technology adoption, who is driving that? We had somebody this morning turn around and said, you know, the ship owners need to drive this. Uh, and then the IMO said, well, actually, we, we, we would like you all to do this within the IMO framework because we've got 174 member states, two associates and a hell of a lot of NGOs. And um, but of course, one of the one of the criticisms of the IMO on I think you, maybe some of you saw it. I made the observation in the chat is that in digital acceleration when you're when you're wanting agility and you've got ports demanding stuff now and everybody demanding stuff now can the imo accommodate that and so 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 who on whom should the onus fall on driving this is it is it is it shipping is it somebody else is it the imo um has, has the panel got any views on that where are the blockages who needs to sort it out eric please uh, I'll say uh, two things. Uh, I'd say inspired by setting standards act, and then actually IATA are looking to DCSA for inspiration of uh, doing something similar on the air freight side. I can actually see we have Hink Mulder from uh, IATA in uh, in the audience here. So uh, uh, you know, a shout out to you for what you're doing on the uh, on the air freight side and standardizing things there. Uh, I think. I guess criticism IMO, nothing's going to happen unless you have 40 odd countries that have adopted uh, whatever IMOs want to have happen, right? Uh, the, the, the glue uh, that sort of holds everything together are uh, ultimately, if you talk about ocean, then, uh, ocean freight, then it's, it's the shipping lines. As I'm saying, as, it's the airlines for air freight, it's other that. Because if, the moment you come to the endpoints, then you have millions and yet millions of end use requirements. So it's only the industry that can work on setting the standards and what DCSS is doing and you know what now ATA are doing and, and looking at asking each other is sort of the, the way forward across the, the, the different modes. I see it'll be very difficult to look for 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 end user uh, end user driving this process too much. I can see Michael, I can see you wanting to get in there. Muted. I think um, uh, I, I would like to echo uh, what Eric is saying, and both um, after listening to Hank today, uh, I, I feel that that uh, this kind of at least complementary drive from the industry is very important. I, I don't think that we should sit and wait for IMO coming up with things because that is in principle driven by member states, and member states, of course, or member states representatives, they need to listen into their stakeholders. But I mean, if uh, I'm very many times um, uh, used the example of, of uh, the Bluetooth when uh, Ericsson and uh, their, their competitors were sitting down in Denmark and saying that let, let us now come up with a standard that we can use all of us, bang, bang, bang. And I think that that, that is um, at least as a complementary uh, way forward. Uh, so uh, let us call it industrial driven standardization processes. 
Uh, the other thing uh, I would like to also echo what Jaco is saying, and, and here I think that, that uh, this is very, very important, and that is that uh, when, when I go to a port, uh, if I come to T um, DP World in Dubai, for example, they will say that, Michael, this is perfect. Uh, we would love to introduce more digital collaboration interfaces, da, 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 as long as our clients are saying it. Okay, you go to the client and you ask the same question, and the, the, the client is going to say, as long as our, our, our client is going to demand it, then we will introduce it. Uh, so you end up at the, at the beneficial cargo owner at the end of the day. So we may be not saying that they should make the standardization, but at least they would be a very important uh, driving force for that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Tisa. I just wanted to to add to that that I think uh, yeah the the setting of the standards definitely needs to be done centrally. Uh, I don't think we can leave that to, to all the different uh, companies working in the in the maritime industry. Uh, but what is important is that there's a drive to uh, adopt these standards because uh, yeah we, we talked about that uh, earlier on in the discussion and it's also what uh, we see when we go and uh, deploy a digital platform in, in various ports that uh, even though there are industry standards the industry is not using those standards yet so you also have to help them to translate all their local events to industry standards and I think uh, as for what uh, Michael said that uh, that's one of the good things that this crisis brings about that in a crisis people become uh, more creative and there is a, a need to change and I think now finally yeah that, that can accelerate this uh, adoption of the standards as well in the in the market. Yeah, Jaco. Yeah, I would like to uh, add something to that, um, especially also to what Michael uh, uh, said. Uh, ultimately, uh, this, let's say, the industry, and now we're talking about the users of the industry, beneficial cargo owners, uh, are likely the best candidates to work together to develop the standards, uh, and we have good bodies for that. We have the uh, UNC fact, as already mentioned by Richard Morton, doing excellent work. GS1 is working closely with two million user companies as well as with UNC fact for the same purposes. Now then we end up with good standards and then we come to DITA's point, they need to be adopted in real life. Now, in order to do that consistently, to take Richard's uh, point earlier, you need to be able to support the industry uh, with guidance, with actual support in implementation. And again, uh, this is not something that can be done free of charge. We have people, we have a 2,000 or so bodies, large organization as GS1 for that specific purpose. DCSA, for instance, they help with guidance to the industry on how to implement the various standards in combinations such that they are consistently implemented across the, grow, across the globe. And we finally have that interoperability that we are all looking for such that the situational awareness that Michael is, is, is promoting can actually be achieved without confusion. Ultimately, when somebody sends information, the intent is for that information to be understood and it can be understood only if standards are implemented correctly and consistently by all those that want to use those standards. Okay, it's a good point. Richard, you had a hand up as well. I mean, I agree. I mean, Michael uh, mentioned earlier about complementary. It needs to be complementary. But if you've actually worked in many of these standards organizations, UNC fact, which was responsible for setting multiple maritime standards, eight years ago, you had six or seven people from around the world coming together. The trade were not engaged. It's the same at the IMO. With the IMO and the work they did on their electronic foul compendium, they're now engaged. But in the first instance, it was our association with BIMCO working with three member states in order to actually help harmonize. And the problem you have is there's a lot of talk about collaboration, harmonization standards, but very few people who actually then get engaged beyond the talking. People here are engaged, but we need to increase that. We've seen the work at the UNC FAC transport and logistics domain increase exponentially because you have the right people in place 
to actually move that forward, to move the technology forward. And also, we need to be very careful. There are standards organizations, as Eric mentioned, emerging and developing new standards. But let's look at some of those standards. Are those actually new standards, or are they standards that have been taken or previously, previously used and are aligned with? So what we're seeing is new standards organizations coming out, aligning new standards that they have developed with other things. And that can cause even more confusion in the marketplace for people to actually find which standards to use. And that's becoming a real challenge, that you don't have this complementarity that there should be between all of the standards organizations, whether they're intergovernmental organizations or trade bodies, um, that there should be. Um, it's about alignment, not harmonization, and it should be about harmonization. Okay, so uh, I mean, the, 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 one of the questions is, wh wh where is that? Where is that coming from? I mean, yes, there's the need. We've seen the need for collaboration. We've talked about that. We've seen the need for harmonization. Who's going to drive it, and for what reasons? Just from my perspective, I think the UN CFACT, uh, the UN international bodies, IMO is a UN agency, ICAO is a UN agency. Uh, many of the other organizations, IATA and others, are all part of the UN. We see that the UN is critical to help drive these forwards. It's already developing API standards, implementations and uh, guidance on that. But the problem is the industry needs to engage in it, and they're not. When you have a meeting and there are 60 people there, um, and we're talking about a global community of traders, um, it's not very many people. Um, and I think you need to actually adapt to that. So from our point of view, UN is a great place to do it. But of course, IMO for Maritime can harmonize like they have. But one of the things that I got from some of the commentary was not IMO. Um, I mean, at least not at the speed that they're going at the moment. So if that's if, if that be true, Michael, you, you Michael Lynn, sorry, I got, we've got there's so many Michaels on the call. Um, but okay, <laughs> Michael, please. Uh, I think, uh, and I, I very much would like to echo what Richard is saying uh, in, in the sense of that uh, the UN body is, is probably the only one reasonable to, to go forward with here when it comes to um, grasping if I, or, or collecting all the needs that come from the industry. But I think that we suffer also from that the industry is not engaged enough in developing their own use cases so that they find the incentives to actually having those standards on the table. Uh, otherwise, then nothing will happen. Uh, so we need to engage in pilots or pilot implementations, uh, etc., so so that the things actually are running, uh, and we are getting away from this talk. And I think we had. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. There's a question that's coming from the audience, which I want to I want to ask. I think it's on this thread. Is it not true that standards are like languages, wherefore data exchange always requires interpretation, validation, conversion before it's uh, used? Is this not why trade lens is tied up with? Is that your EDI? Is that the? Is that, I've, not, I've not heard familiar with that organisation. Anybody got that? If if I'm uh, since I am the standards guy, I think on this uh, on this call. Um, so there will always be a a level, uh, let's say, of interpretation of standards. Standards are expressed in language, and and uh, as always, uh, people write language one way, and hopefully, other someone else reads it in the same way. So we're coming back to the earlier point, where I said that industry, so many different stakeholders trying to implement the same standard or set of standards or whatever you want to call it, system of standards, you will need some kind of a um, support mechanism such as GS1, um, uh, that's the largest one that I know about anyway, that can help the industry implement and interpret the language correctly. Uh, that's that's uh, unfortunately still uh, the, the, the way we are at uh, the moment. Uh, there are talks about things like semantic web, uh, ontologies, automatic translations between the various ontologies that may exist in areas of the supply chain. Um, in my view, that's fairly theoretical for the moment, and it will take at least many years before that is actual common 
um, widely applied technology in, in transport and logistics. Uh, so we have to deal with the confusion of language for a while. Yes, Richard. Yeah, just quickly on the, the question. We also have to recognize that when you're an authority, you have to consider what the data is that you're looking at. If you're a maritime authority, port of arrival means arrival in port territory, which could be 12 miles out at sea. However, if you're a customs authority, generally port of arrival means quayside. So it's, it's not just about the language, it's about what the data of that language means. And that's really critical because it relates to processes. So I think that's something that we always have to consider. Um, as poor community systems, since their inception, they have always translated between one standard and another. And this interoperability that we need, where the, you have harmonization of the data standards, the data elements, will actually help that a great deal. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. We're nearly at the end of our time, and I wanted to bring this to a close. Uh, we've had uh, we've talked about pandemics and data and all sorts of standards. So here's the last final question, and you've got a short fire round as to answering it. What are you most looking forward to in 2021? And starting, I'll well, we'll start with from the top, Michael Rohde. You're muted. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, Eric. I'm thinking about this one because it's a tough call. Sorry, I'm looking I just, forward to I just. I just hijacked. No, it's fine. I'm looking forward to travel again. To be honest, right? Uh, I mean, Eric lives honestly. How far away from me do you live? I don't know. Twenty minute drive. I never see you. Uh, Dita, I haven't seen. Yeah, yeah, twenty minutes. Dita, we used to see each other all the time. Now I don't see you anymore. Uh, so I'm looking forward to traveling, getting out again, and seeing everyone, and and driving business. Brilliant, Peter. Yeah, that's very uh, unoriginal, but I definitely uh, echo that we work in a in a global industry, and it's so weird to do everything uh, from from your uh, home office. So I think it's time uh, that that changes again. And secondly, uh, I'm really looking forward also to um, to making impact with uh, with some uh, great projects uh, with industry collaborations and uh, yeah, bringing uh, uh, the, the the theory of digitalization to. Uh, to life and to practice in, uh, in the maritime world. Brilliant. Richard? Having a beer with somebody outside the country um, and actually talking about the real issues rather than just um, theorizing about them. So really just meeting people back up and bringing back that face to face because that actually will help the whole conversation we've had today about standards, collaboration and networking globally. Great. So I hope Kathy's bearing with me here. Jaco. <laughs> well, um, same as uh, before, I like working with people, but I also sort of look forward to something I more or less dread. And that's 1st of July 2021, when the new EU VAT regulations for e-commerce kick in. Uh, and that is a, well, I think it's a an order of magnitude even more serious than the Brexit, Mike. So I'm hoping... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, this, uh, that, that's, a I'm going to leave it at that, otherwise Michael Lind and Eric Lund can respond. <laughs> I, did, I didn't mention the B word once. Uh, Mike, Michael Lind. Uh, I would say um, implementation, implementation, implementation. So I would say an implemented and validated use case for global supply chain interoperability engaging stakeholders across modes of transports. Brilliant. That I would like to see in 2021. Eric? Uh, you know, who can beat when Michael had prepared a beautiful speech like that <laughs> with key statements of everything. I just want to be with friends and it's not to be 2020 anymore. Yeah. Well, I think, well, you've just stolen my conclusion because, yes, I just want <laughs> it to be not 2020 anymore. And I'm looking forward to a beer with friends. So um, uh, with that, I just want to thank the panel. Thank you, the panelists. Huge amount of work goes into preparing for these things. And I'll hand it back over to you, Kathy. Thanks very much. Thank you.